go. And so you're in control and I'm gonna head out. All right, sounds great, thank you. All Thanks, right, Kelly. Bye guys. <clears throat> All right, so we got Jeff here, we got Brian. You haven't met Brian yet. Um, there he is. Hey, Brian. Hi, Brian. Long time no see. Does <laughs> everybody hear me okay? We can. Yep, we awesome. do. Very good. I guess we'll give Carolyn another minute or two. And then on the agenda, I just listed everything that uh, that you actually that we had talked about previously that you put in the uh, in the email that you sent. Yeah. So we'll get to as much as we can today, and yep. you know, just keep plugging away. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I can give you a you know state of the state of the state, shall we say? And you know, just so you are familiar with the things that I see every day, and and uh, I hear about from others, like. God, Quentin Drive is horrible. You know, like when are they gonna repave that and <laughs> stuff like? And I've 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 actually gotten pricing on things like that. And of course, you know, like it's the first thing cut from the budget when things get cut is uh, right. People will just drive slower on that bumpy road. It's not a bad idea, I suppose. But <laughs> no, no, especially with all the kids around. Right. Exactly. So, <clears throat> but yeah. What is a train wreck over there? I mean, I, I you know drop off in the morning and and I don't even go down to, eat, to pick up. I just go to the library because I'm like, I'm not going yep. down there again to- Why, why fight that line? No, it's, it's insane. brutal. It's insane. And then, you know, then people that are in the morning are going, you know, if they're going left and uh, turning towards, uh, you know, Wentworth instead of going straight and- Yeah, then it backs all the way up. And the nobody level. lets anybody go or they let too many people go or it's yep. just- I saw yesterday that the car was, you know, pulling up and the bus is trying to turn and the car is not giving it enough space. So I'm like, they got to back up. And then they, I'm like, oh, I'm just watching it going. This is just, do people yeah. not know how to drive or, or are they just <laughs> dumb when they get near the school? I don't know. I know. You forget, or you forget what, you know, what's, what, uh, you know, the rules are, but. I mean, the middle school would be so much better served if we could somehow make a road right out through the back. So they go, you know, out around somehow, you know, reconfigure the field or something so they can go out around and end up on Sawyer Road, you know, or just something, just something to get, get to a better place. I know, yeah, because, you know, everything that goes in has got to come back out and then it's just gridlock and. Yeah. Haven't they been talking about that for years, Todd? They have, and they, you know, we've been sitting on our hands because we're, I mean, all of, all of this feels like it's being held, you know, tentatively until we understand the outcome of this referendum, which is kind of what I put on, you know, as an agenda item is like, what do we do if the referendum for the new school doesn't pass? Do we then, do we, do we wait until then to move ahead with some of these items? Because the items are going to be there either way. And I think Jeff, you might have even been asked by one of the town councilors, like, why aren't you building secure entrance vestibules on the two schools that don't have them now? Because we're still going to have them for the next four or five years, even if the referendum does pass. So right, and yeah, I mean, the challenge a little bit with that question, uh, which I addressed with the councilor, is that you know, particularly, I mean, if you're if you're talking the K to two schools, which obviously we have been as far as uh, you know security concerns, as it's tied into one of the reasons for for a new consolidated school, 
is that the security concerns at, at the three elementary schools, I mean, yes, the front en entrance and having a vestibule or not having a vestibule is definitely one of, is a major concern, particularly when you consider how schools are now designed and entrances are designed. Um, but the fact that you've got multiple classrooms and portables with their own entrances and exits, and you know, that, that, that is of equal concern, right? It's not just the front answer entrance that's a security concern as far as securing the building. Right. Uh, you know, it's obviously having a bulk, you know, multiple classrooms and separated from the, from the main part of the building. Yeah, and that's true at middle school on eight corners and has been for, you know, several years now. Right, right. So that, that's all kind of tied in. But yes, I mean, a certain amount of money um, to reconfigure the entrances so that there's a vestibule and that any visitor must first access the office prior to having access to all the rooms is something that could be done. Um, you know, I think that the, the expense is probably more than, than one might think. It absolutely um, is. Because <laughs> uh, we actually, you know, I, I've done that in a previous district. We did, we did it at the, um, at Falmouth High School and then also at the middle school, reconfigured the entrances um, to create those spaces and areas. And, um, the two price tags were, were very different and a lot more than I think people originally anticipated. Well, most people think that a secure vestibule means just putting another box with a walls and doors outside the main entrance. And that's not the way it works. The, you have to have the office have access to that little vestibule. Right. So that there can be a gatekeeper, so to speak, you yeah. know, who's talking to people while they're in that little between space and exactly. if they access they get buzzed in if they're not they get sent out but it's, a, just right, have, it's that secondary it's that yeah. secondary layer so we have it at most of our schools um but those two don't have it because it was too difficult to reconfigure the entire office and entrance um it would have involved well it probably would have been in the six figures or more back then when we did it, which was right after Sandy Hook, which is why we then didn't do it. We just said the doors are going to stay locked the whole time. And you give them a little microphone to talk and say, hi, I'm here for Mr. Kelleher. Okay, great. You know, and that's, that was our, our alternative. So anyway, a little boring history there, Brian. <laughs> Good to know either way. Yeah. You know, it's definitely, a, you know, if we can get it to, you know, obviously safety has got to be a, you know, a concern and whatever we have to do. I don't, you know, I don't know, but I'm always down for safety. Yep. And yeah, uh, no, I, I, we, I guess Todd and I brought, bring that up just because, or I, I bring it up, is, you know, it's not, it's not just a quick and easy fix. Just do it. What are you waiting for? Right. Right. It's a little right. more complex than that. Yep. And, you know, then I guess it's like a chicken and egg thing. So we all want it to be safe. And so we, well, let's say we went ahead and did it and spent, I don't know, $300,000. I'm just pulling a number out of the air. It's probably less than that. But let's just say it's that, that much money. And we get them all done and set up and working. And then will will that harpoon our initiative for the elementary school you know yeah. oh, well, you know you've taken care of that security issue so you don't have any up you know you don't have any other concerns yeah we do <laughs> so yeah. it won't be very secure uh, you know teaching kids on the lawn because we don't have any room in the school right <laughs> exactly we'll put them in tents yeah so no, Todd, Todd cut down some trees and we got stumps for kids to sit on. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. I love I love working with a chainsaw. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that's always an ongoing thing for me, is thinking about that and 
uh, there was a there was a reference to like more security cameras are needed at the elementary schools and you know those we've just been plugging away at when when there's a, a void in someone's camera view and you can't see a section of a building or you don't have a good the right view of a playground or a bus loop or a parent drop off area um, we add cameras and we have money to do that and adding cameras is you know, it's a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars here and there. It's not like it's going to be, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to add. You know, can't. It's not that kind of an ask. Every year, I ask for a little safety and security money, and it and it keeps those funds going forward for upgrading older cameras, and um, uh, you know, adding new ones where you have, you know, lack of a of a view. So, you know, and I, and I just talk with the building principals and say, where do you need them? And they tell me and I put them in when school's in vacation. <clears throat> I added just just this past vacation, there were four added at the middle school. Uh, two in the lunch line because kids were stealing things out of the cooler before they got to the cash register and the cashiers couldn't see them and two outside bathrooms to catch kids who are going into the bathrooms vandalizing them <laughs> so it's like you just four more cameras there you go done you know so we just we piece away at it and we keep we keep after it so um and then the the other security piece i think really is back to our original topic was the the traffic for student drop off and bus loops and the traffic jams that happen around all the schools. It's it's a it's sort of an unmanageable thing, but but we do the best we can right now given our little postage stamp sites that we have. I don't know if any of you have been to Pleasant Hill lately, but Pleasant Hill and Eight Corners, it just seems crazy there. <laughs> Those two places in terms of the traffic but between the buses and the and the student drop off, and I'm glad out, of, out of there before before this all happened. Yeah, <laughs> and we've had um, uh, Eric Greenleaf uh, down in front of Wentworth yes. um, at arrival in particular, but then also at some dismissals too. Really trying to help manage um, the traffic and and some of the issues that you were describing, John, with you know people getting in the way of buses and you know just trying to keep everybody in line so to speak in fact i asked him at the demt meeting as an aside i'm like you need like a little pointer or some kind of I see, that's his classroom down there that little <laughs> the little <laughs> drop off little drop off hook, hook, hook there but that's i think that's helped um having you know more presence there to just to kind of help with with the flow of cars and everything else because it, it obviously is a challenge absolutely well that will, uh, you know obviously we'll have to um figure out you know what uh you know what we should do um and i'll, I'll you know i'll probably reach out to you know the whole board and you know bring up the question on, you know, is this something that we want to <clears throat> focus on? You know, like we were talking about some of the long-term things, if the referendum doesn't pass, how we want to mm -hmm. proceed with that, what should we be doing? Mm -hmm. it doesn't, I mean, I think it would be foolish for us to start scrambling then after that when, you know, I mean, just because we're planning on something, it's just, you know, just, just in case we can have a plan so that we're not, you know, then scrambling and saying, oh God, what are we going to do? Right. And I think, you know, to be a responsible property owner, um, if you were going to sell your house, let's say, you wouldn't just let it fall to hell and then, you know, dump it on some unsuspecting buyer. So even if the referendum passes, we'd, we'd like to hand off a building to the town that's not condemnable, you know, right. so, uh, so you could repurpose it for either community use or sell it for, you know, some other buyer to use for something so i you know we're not going to let the roofs 
start leaking and we're not going to let the heating systems fail and we're not going to you know have the windows and doors rusting and rotting out we're going to keep keep the building maintained i think that's the responsibility we have to take um regardless of whether we close them all or keep them all um and especially if we keep them all so right <clears throat> Now you had mentioned something about uh, boilers, I think, at uh, or was it Pleasant Hill? And yes, so we're, we are now at the thirty. We're in our thirty-first year oh, of, the of the boilers uh, at Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill. Uh, they have the uh, boilers that were put in at the renovation in nineteen ninety-two. Um, I have the ones already ordered and for, for replacement at uh, eight corners. And so those will probably get done this summer. Uh, they continue to run fine. They're just not particularly efficient and they're both they're, they're both leaking and we've re, repacked them both a couple times and kept them going. So now it's just time to you know cut bait. Uh, there's one old boiler at Blue Point. One of them failed a few years ago, and I replaced one and kept the old one, which was fine. So we have sort of a 50% plant there that's partly new and and partly not 30-year-old boiler. And then at Pleasant Hill, they're both they're both the originals from 1992. And then at the middle school, those are 1996 boilers. Um, possibly they might be might have a date stamped on them from 1995. So that is a that's a big um, <laughs> a big undertaking to to replace that boiler plant. Those are large large boilers that heat a much bigger building. Um, they are natural gas fired, which is good, um, but they're they're it's a it's a <laughs> they struggle to keep up on the coldest windiest days in that building. And then connected to that because it's an air conditioned building. So it's part of the HVAC plant is something called a cooling tower, which has piping running underground to the building to this tower out back. If you've seen it, it's kind of got this ugly fence around it. That's a tall, gray, hideous thing. And when it's air conditioning, it, it sends the, the glycol loop water out there and it gets cooled by this tower, which has fans and mist spraying on it. And then it pipes the cooler water loop back to the building. So that that and the boilers itself are going to be a very expensive um, undertaking. You know, potentially a million or more dollars. <clears throat> I can't, don't quote me on that, but it's it's not going to be, you know, a hundred grand to do the whole thing. It's going to be a lot. So. And then what, what do you think would, would be in terms of, you know, what we have left before that has to happen? You know, typical life expectancy for boilers like that are 30 years. So that's why we're, we're at the point at the K2 schools where we, we should be replacing them before they have a catastrophic failure. And, and they'll only fail in January when it's right. 12, 12 degrees outside. <laughs> <Of course>. uh, <laughs> um, so that's why I, I've just systematically planned to have eight corners done. It was, we were really hoping to get it done this fall, but the boilers, it was a it was a production issue. The boilers didn't get, we didn't get them. <laughs> so now we're still waiting for them to come in. So we're not going to do it during a school operational time. So when they come in, we'll, uh, we'll do them this summer. And I was probably going to ask for the money to do to Pleasant Hill because it's such a long lead time to, to order the boilers. Um, the, the, for some reason, same age, same exact brand, same exact size boilers at Pleasant Hill don't seem to be quite as tired as the ones at eight corners. I don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea why, but the ones at Pleasant Hill seem to be in a little bit better shape. They're not leaking. They're very reliable. They, they have not had an issue to speak of other than the regular maintenance that you do on your home boiler. And those are oil boilers. Those are not natural gas boilers. So they're, it's unfortunate because we just don't have access to natural gas there. So going forward, they'll be oil. Can yeah, I, I actually put a dual fuel burner on them. So if natural gas were to ever come, you'd just swap out the burner on it and convert it to natural gas. So the boiler itself will be able to run either with a different burner on it. So 
I'm hoping and anticipating that and I even had a big meeting with Unitil because Eight Corners is so ripe. It's right there off Payne Road. There's natural gas a, a quarter to a half mile away. And they, they came and they looked at all our appliances and the 10 classrooms at Eight Corners that have propane fired heaters and all those modulars. And they still just said there's not enough load for us to justify putting a pipe in the ground here. Gee. It's like 4 million BTUs or something and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> so anyway, we try. So those will be new new oil boilers and a dual fuel burner on it. So we can convert it if it ever becomes gas. And then, uh, so I guess next thing we have on the list is, uh, is talking about the uh, the uh, the playground equipment. Yes. What uh, was that stuff that needs to be replaced or? Yeah. So there's a couple issues at the at the elementary schools, the K two schools. Uh, they have some accessibility issues for ADA kids. Um, the wood chips we use on the playground are supposed to be wheelchair compliant. Like you can roll a wheelchair across them to get a child to the the playground fixture that they want to play on. Um, but most of the time, the people uh, who are the assist, assistant of the child in the wheelchair are often, they're just, I mean, it, it just takes a lot of effort. It takes some of my size to move the child in the chair. And most of the time they're with, you know, a small young person, man or woman, and it's just too difficult. And certainly winter, it's out of the question. Um, so you'll see some project happening this spring with the Wentworth playground where we're making a, a much more ADA compliant area. We're putting some artificial grass in with some ADA specific things that the kids can play with and on. Um, and it'll give her a direct path to the, the ADA swings, which are different. Um, and Eight Corners is the other school that really it's harder to access those things. So we've built little wooden paths and things like that to wheel the child across, which is great. Actually, Rosbera donated money to help us do that a couple of years ago at Eight Corners because we had a, a child in a motorized wheelchair. That child is now at Wentworth. Um, so anyway, they just they keep cycling through and it's just you know, we have to do it. It's the responsible and right thing to do. Unfortunately, it's expensive. <laughs> Playground equipment is expensive because you buy it once every 30 years, you know? And so you pay once and you pay hard, but then you use it for 30 years. So, um, so really eight corners is the one I would focus on because I know that's where a high level of our most, uh, uh, kids in ADA situations, whether they're in a wheelchair or just have some assisted walking device, that would be the, the playground that I'd probably focus on next after Went. So I'm going to really see how this goes with Wentworth and then see if we can do something similar to eight corners. <laughs> if, if we can get the referendum passed, I, I, might drag, I might drag my feet. I don't know. It's it really depends on the student population. I wait to hear. What we've done in the interim is if you've ever been to a beach, You've seen they sometimes have these mesh metal mats to get across the sand, and those are designed for people in wheelchairs to access the beach. So we've used those at both eight corners and and Wentworth in the in the in the intermediary time. So now, is this these items that are already budgeted for, or that would need to? No, no. I haven't. I ha I mean, the Wentworth one is already budgeted for, and and in the last year's budget, I'm just again waiting for the equipment to come in. <laughs> so, it's been ordered, and I have all the artificial grass. I'm just waiting for the install because you got to wait for the equipment, and then you you grass around it. Um, but at Eight Corners, I haven't ordered anything because um, it's just been like one of the things on the list. So it'll probably be the next the next one we do, and I don't really know. So. You know, we're talking about about 100 to 120 thousand dollars is what we're spending at Wentworth for that installation. So I would think that it would be something along that line, maybe a little less because the Eight Corners playground isn't as big, so you probably wouldn't do quite as much there. Um, so yeah, so again, it's not millions of dollars, but it's 
it's a lot right in my world and the playground equipment you know you get you know 60 or 70 thousand dollars of equipment and and the installation of that equipment doesn't get you it gets you six or eight pieces of stuff <laughs> it's just really crazy so so that's just something that's constantly on my mind i know in the past like pto groups have paid for little installations here and there for things but i mean that's, that's a you gotta ask a pto to raise eighty five thousand dollars. i mean <laughs> right yeah a lot, yeah. a lot of bake sales. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, so I just really think that if we're going to keep these schools running and we're going to have this student population coming through, it just needs to be fair and equitable for those kids to access these things. Agreed. So, and then the other piece was the paving. Um, Quentin Drive has needed paving, I believe, for at least five years. Uh, and then there's the teacher parking lot and the parking lot on the other side of the portable, the sixth grade portable, which if you look carefully at them, there's more rubber crack filling lines on them than there is actually pavement because I've patched them together for so long. Um, so if I were to resurface any paving, I would start Quentin Drive and Middle School first and then gradually piece away at the massive parking lots at the high school, which aren't in as bad a shape. But I try to crack fill and black seal and then reline them, you know, again, chop them up and spend, you know, 20 or $25,000 a year on that kind of stuff, just to keep them rotational. So we're not, you know, having it all in one big lump. Todd, can I step back to um, the ADA um, playgrounds that you were mentioning a minute ago? I, I was clicking yes. on my unmute button and I couldn't get it to unmute. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Nice to meet you, by the way. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Sorry I'm late. I didn't check email last night, so I didn't know we had a meeting today okay. until, until John kindly texted me. Where have you? <laughs> so, um, so if we put money towards uh, putting in the playground for eight corners, I think, did you say eight corners or Pleasant Hill? I can't remember which one. Uh, eight, eight corners, corners would be the first. Eight corners would be the first one. Yeah. Um, would any of that be transferable over to the new, uh, the new K through three building, or would we just be starting fresh? Um, the answer is yes. You can mm -hmm. actually uninstall it and reinstall it. We did that with the old Wentworth. We actually. Um, we had a temporary playground and then we took some pieces and reinstalled them in the new playground. Um, it saves you the cost of the actual item, you know, swings yeah. or whatever, the monkey bars or whatever they are. Yeah. Um, you just have every, all of that stuff is in concrete. So you have to pay someone to like, you know, smash off the old concrete, then you pour new concrete and reset it. So it's, yes, it's possible. And I guess the answer is, I would support doing that. Um, Cost as effective. Long, yeah, as long as the town wasn't planning on, say, using Eight Corners as a community center where they have children, I wouldn't want to like leave big holes in the playground for for the next user if it's already bought and paid for. <laughs> yeah. You know? No. Understood. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so that that stuff can be done, and it has been done even in in my time here. The biggest issue is the surfacing. So if we do build a new school, I'm going to push really hard for the more expensive initial surfacing, because it's kind of like putting in a a waxable floor. You spend thousands and thousands of dollars in, in in product and labor to keep the floor looking nice and shiny. When if you just put in a rubber floor, you know, it'll never crack. You just wash it and go. There's no shining it or waxing it or polishing it. You just wash it and go and it lasts for 25 years and you're good. Um, the same goes for this outdoor playground surfacing that, you know, everybody's like, oh, no, wood chips. Those are the cheapest. Well, I got to add wood chips every year and I'm spending twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year on wood chips. <laughs> and it's like, you know, not to mention the labor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I pay a company to come in, they blow them in, and you know, it's just it adds up. It just yeah. adds up. Man. So if you just 
paid the, the higher end dollar, then you get the safety, you get the yeah. longevity, you get the accessibility. It's all built into that one, whether it's a poured in place surface or artificial grass surface or some other rubberized product. To me, after you know the years I've been here, it's like, yeah, this is this is the way to go. And I've talked to a lot of other playgrounds. I live in Portland, so I've talked to the school folks here and they've put in some of these rubber surface playgrounds in other the elementary schools and they love them. They've been holding up well, they're durable. You can shovel them off so you, a kid in a wheelchair could get on them in the winter time. <laughs> so, fantastic. Yeah. So it's really the way to go. It's just- yeah, It know, sounds like it. The initial cost is a little shocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the scary part. <laughs> it always is. It's just yeah. always. But you have to look at it as a long-term investment. It's going to be there when the school's 25 years old, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, right. those, are the, those are the things. I mean, do you have any thoughts or ideas about any of the schools that you've driven through and looked at them, dropping off your kids and wondering about things like that's looks like it's falling apart or <laughs> I can't say that I have it's Josh usually takes the bus so oh there you go <laughs> yeah so once in a while I get to do and get I get to wait in line and do that whole joy of, yep. uh, of waiting to drop off or pick up but it's not very often but whenever I'm out of I mean you obviously do a great job because I'm rather fussy, so I haven't seen anything that stands <laughs> out to me. I, I, my wife kicks me under the table when I go out to eat because I'm constantly looking around, you know, and she'll be like, stop, you don't, you don't, have, to worry about, you don't have to worry about this building. Stop it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, Fantastic. Yeah. So, but yeah, that, and I just think that some of these bigger items we've, we haven't done anything about for quite a while. And you know, we've said this, you know, Brian, I don't know if you've heard this yet in our building committee meeting, but things don't get cheaper if you put them off, they get more expensive. So as an example, the paving of Quentin Drive, I got quotes from two or three different pavers, I think three years ago, and it was going to be to pave from the library all the way up through the school, through the parent drop the student drop off loop and the bus loop and then back out around that teardrop the, the two lanes around the teardrop was going to be 180,000 something dollars to grind it off and then just pave it with another layer on top and I bet it's going to be 350,000 now <laughs> it's three years later I bet I bet it's going to be at least 300,000 it's just going to be like <laughs> You keep waiting, it keeps getting more expensive. That's what frustrates me. So I don't know if if the town council ever talks about that or not, but waiting doesn't pay in most circumstances when it comes to facility stuff. There's, there's only one other item that I thought of as we were talking, uh, John, and I didn't put it in my email, but the high school auditorium. Uh, You've been, I'm assuming you, most of you have been in there. So yep. there's, a, there's a front and a back to the auditorium. And there's a big wall that's movable um, that you can open and close and, and the back has bleachers. So uh, that wall <laughs> is, is failing. Um, the panels are about 18 feet tall and about three or four feet wide and to move to move the wall you move each section and it's a manual process um and they're starting to you know come off the track fall down and it takes you know three men and a bunch of equipment to try and get them assembled back together so at some point i need to find a company that will replace that and that will be a capital item it'll be more than a hundred thousand dollars to replace a wall too <laughs> But again, it's 1988 or 89, I think that auditorium went on. So again, it's been a lot of years, 30, 35 years. So we've gotten our money's worth. It's been open and closed a lot. <laughs> so what do they use that for? Like, why did, do they just don't want that back bleacher section open for some reason? Or yeah, is that sometimes acoustic it, or yeah, something? It's, it's partly acoustic. So sometimes if it's a smaller event, 
I think the front of the auditorium seats about 400 people and you can keep the wall closed and everything sounds better. And then the air conditioning works a little better because it's just trying to air condition that, that centers, that space. And then if you have a bigger event, like to have, you know, all the student body in there, I think it seats 740 if you open the wall and pull out the bleachers in the back. So you get about another 350 people or so in there, um, you know, and you can still see everything from those back bleachers you just farther away. So. Is it to the point of where it's a safety issue based on what you were saying? Not yet, um, but it's getting to the point now where you, when you put each panel back in place, there's a special wrench that you turn a knob and it locks the, the bottom so the, so the panels don't swing. And those bottom lock-in positions are starting to, to break and you know just deteriorate and fall apart. So they're still being held in place. But at this point, it used to be I'd let the auditorium staff move the wall. And now I'll only let my maintenance guys do it because they know how to handle it with, with delicate hands. The problem is there aren't a lot of companies that do that work. So <laughs> the same guy who did the high school wall also did the wall on the stage at Wentworth and then he went out of business. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, so now I don't, I, I need to like go back to the well and like send it out to my listserv and say, who do you have? Do you have portable movable walls? And if so, who? Who do you have do them? Because yeah, they're 18 feet high too. Jeez. Yeah, they're huge. And, you know, honestly, a wall like that, I think it would be better if it were motorized. So you don't have the physical, I mean, it's going to be a workplace injury or something, you know, mm -hmm. someone could hurt themselves doing it. So I remember it was a last minute thing last spring and there was a dance recital and it was a rented, you know, third party group. And they said, oh, we need the wall open. We, we paid for the whole auditorium and there was no one in the building. So I came from my house and drove in and I did the whole wall myself. And I was, I was like in a full body sweat, you know, <laughs> these panels. I'm like, wow, I'm glad I don't do this by myself very often. It's just, it's a really laborious job. So mm -hmm. that's why we usually have like four, all four maintenance guys go in and just do it, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. But yeah, it's, it's a big job. So uh, that one is gonna be on my list if not this year, in the next year, because it just needs to be replaced, so. And the auditorium guys are great. They give me a list every year of capital items, so you'll probably see some things, you know, changing a door here and there, or upgrading a sound system. They do all that, you know, the estimation there, so. But again, we're not talking millions, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, so it's still real money. Excellent. So what, um, so what is it that we need to do as a committee here to, to get any of this, you know, rolling and moving forward? Um, I guess, uh, I, I'm not really sure how the, you know, the capital isn't part of the vote for the school budget, if I remember correctly. So really, I think it, when it comes, whoever's on the, is it someone on the finance committee, maybe for the board, Jeff, do you know how that goes or how that works? Yeah, I would have, I know when I submit budgets for companies, it all goes together, but maybe Jeff, Jeff might know more than I, I'm new. <laughs> yeah. So I think what happens is the, our, I do two budget sessions or whatever, one with uh, Kate for my operating budget, which is just, you know, wages and salaries, utilities and so forth, supplies. And then the other is always a capital budget. So if we need major equipment replacement, I have all these different categories, electrical, plumbing, um, and so forth. And I've got a running list of all those things that I just keep with Kate. And the auditorium is the one that the auditorium guys have already submitted to us. So Kate and I have that. But I guess in terms of what you can do is know that. Uh, What's that? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we had talked, I mean, to your question, John, I mean, we had talked, um, this was probably a little over a year ago. I think Todd, you're a part of this too, about kind of renaming this committee, uh, uh, you know, a facilities committee, which yeah. uh, essentially is, I think, how it's functioned. And you know, trying to, I mean, I like the fact that long range is part of the name because um, part of what gets talked about um, in these meetings 
has to do with establishing, you know, because, you know, at least with facilities and then also with how we budget um, and part of the finance committee is very much, it's a year to year process, right? But you have to think further out than that. So when you're talking about capital improvements and projects that, you know, when you're replacing, you know, as Todd is mentioning, you know, topics like, you know, whether it's playground equipment or, or a boiler or burners, I mean, these are things that you, you, you hope to only have to do once every 20, 25, 30 years, right? So, but they, they all come due in, in, at different times and, and maintaining that cycle of, of replacement and then larger investments, um, you know, is a critical part of the planning process. All right. So Todd, I'm just looking at, so we just had our finance committee meeting Monday, I think, yeah, Monday. Um, and it looks like, I was just looking through our notes and uh, the package that Kate put together for us, there is a school uh, capital improvements project listing. Yeah. Um, so I would assume that that is where all these things would yep. fit. It would fit in there, exactly. Uh, but whether that's, uh, Jeff, do you know if that's approved? If that goes through a separate approval process, then the vote in town? It does. It does. Yeah. And it's, and it's approved by the town council, too, because I think they include it all together because it's bonded money. Okay. Um, and so. Right. I, yeah, and that's something like a lot of these larger investments or replacements or equipment, you're talking about things that wouldn't fit into like a year to year budget line. So, um, you know, you've got to find obviously other sources of how to finance and or um, and pay for those when they come up. Yeah. And so oftentimes I will get money. Uh, for example, last year I asked for money for roofing that I knew I wasn't going to do until the summer of 2023 because it was a whole year to get the roofing material. Um, it was a, so I had to order my roofing material last spring so that I could have it for two summers later. And so oftentimes the money will be, you know, granted in the capital budget, but I won't use it till a year and a half later. And that sort of brings me to the point now because COVID threw everything off, but um, the budget cycle to get big projects done in the in the schools, you know, the, the only time to do that is during some, the summer for bigger projects. Um, and so the budget cycle timing for capital doesn't really work for us anymore because of this whole supply chain implosion that happened because of COVID. So now... I'm really planning sort of two years ahead and saying, okay, I want the auditorium wall. I have to order it in, you know, whenever the capital budget is approved in May or early June or whatever. But I know I'm not going to do it in Ju June or July of this year. I'm going to wait till the following summer to get it done. So you have to ask for the money so much earlier now, uh, which is hard because stuff still breaks. So sometimes I might just ask for, you know, $300,000 for HVAC, knowing that a heat pump or six will fail at the middle school and I got to replace them because you need them. And so you just, there might, you might see a lump and say, well, I want an itemization of how you're going to spend that money. And I'll say heat pumps at the middle school, air handlers at the high school in Wentworth, you know, heating units in here. And you're just going to, you're going to get a generalization for me because some of it is, oh my God, it blew up in January and I need to fix it because we need heat. <laughs> so, so some of it's in that category too. So I try to itemize it all, but for example, last year we spent about $350,000 on heat pumps at the middle school alone. <laughs> and there's 123 of them. So we're about halfway done. <laughs> so I'll keep asking for more money. Yeah. So I can I can bore you to tears with all this nauseating, excitement, riveting information. <laughs> and have you narrowed it down or figured out what you were going to ask for for this in this budget? Uh, not yet. I'm sitting down with Kate next week. Okay. To take our first pass at it. 
Um, the one thing I always, I mean, I, I always ask for electrical improvements and HVAC money. Um, electrical improvements actually pay us back. So you may have these old fluorescent fixtures that are failing and it's just cheaper to replace them with high efficiency LED and you save about half um, on, on energy use. So, so we're doing the cafeteria over April vacation. You know, it'll be, I don't know, 10 or $12,000, but we're gonna cut our energy use in half or better in the cafeteria. So, you know, that, that's the kind of thing where we just chunk away at and hopefully get paid back. Every time you replace, we upgrade to save money. So, yeah, so you'll get to see that list <laughs> soon, probably in the next week or two, whenever, I don't know when you start talking about it as the board, but we'll be going after that we've then. We've got a, uh, I know we've got a, a workshop in March on like the 14th and 15th. Yeah. Um, on a, you know, it's like a Monday, Tuesday night and then during the day. And mm -hmm. that's when everybody you know, brings everything to, you know, this is what we're looking at. I'm like, oh, yeah, dump it all on you then, right? So yeah, so we're you know probably like just over six weeks out. Yeah, from, from that. Well, I'll have I'll have mine, you know, obviously, obviously together before that and for that. So, but if you have any questions about things in the in the interim, feel free to, you know, reach out and ask because I usually keep a running list. General, like you try to target you know, 1.5 million or less, or is there like a general range or it's just as the needs, you know, so, what you know the needs can be or will be? So the main DOE recommends that we spend 2% of the value of our physical plant on capital improvements every year. Our physical plant, and then the last time I'm meeting with the uh, insurance appraiser next, at the beginning of February, I think it's next week, the February 1st, he's going to go over and reappraise all of our buildings so that we're insured for the right values. But the last time they did an appraisal, they evaluated the entire physical plant at Scarborough at $150 million. Does that sound strange to you? <laughs> Cause it does to me. So try to rebuild the high school. If it, let's say it, God forbid, and it wouldn't ever, but let's just say it burned to the ground tomorrow and we had to build a whole new high school. You could never do it for 150 million. So let's just say though that it's worth 150 million. We should be spending three million a year in capital improvements by the DOE standards. But we don't. We spend more like half to one percent. You know. Yeah, I see the budget for this year is about one point, almost one point five. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, uh, well. Yeah, that's Again, just I, the facilities, yeah. Yeah, I ask for bigger things and some of it has to get cut. And so yeah. they. the good news is I, I am allowed to cut what I think is of least value. So, you know, I'm partly to blame for not repaving Quentin Drive in the parking lots because it's like, well, at least if it's rough, people will slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Built-in speed bumps, you know. No, um, I hate those speed bumps. But we need heat and we need no, light. I know, you need them. <laughs> you know? So... I prioritize the mechanical and electrical things because we got to keep things running. And then if I get extra money to do other things, I do it. So. That's all you can got do. Another, yeah, I got yeah. another question for you too, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, go so ahead. One thing I'm learning on being the finance on being on the finance committee is that you Kate was saying that um, you know, if you're under in one area and over in another. Well, you can't go over, I guess, but you can't use, there's some stipulations on using underages in one bucket to compensate for a potential overage somewhere else. Is right. the same, is there that same thing in the capital planning as well? Yeah, they, um, I, I, that's why I have those categories because they're all yeah. numbered in munis. And uh, so, you know, I guess there's, there's some fudging in there and, uh, and I'll use an HVAC example. Every heat pump in the middle school has some electrical components to it. So if I ran low in my HVAC account and I knew that my electrician had to change some wiring over or fix some electrical component, I could steal some of that expense for that heat pump repair from my electrical side because it really involved both trades and both categories. 
Um, and then we have in our operating budget, we have more of a general, a general account that can help, you know, that's not labeled a specific category um, for those emergencies. Um, but it's, again, it's not an unlimited amount of money, but um, it's something that can, you know, catch an overage if, some, or an emergency repair that has to happen or you close school, um, that type of thing. But yeah, I try to stick pretty strictly to the, to the categories. But some of the categories are kind of generic. Like one of them is called movable equipment. You know, it could be a tractor. That's a movable equipment, and so is a floor scrubber. I mean, so is furniture. It's all it's all movable. You know, you can move it from one school to another, and it can be used at the high school or the middle school. But um, so that that's sort of a bigger, more broad category account. But typically, when I ask for money in there. I already have a quote for I need, you know, 200 desks and they cost X. That's the amount. I hope that's helpful. It's very much so. All right back to you, John. Sorry, I'm taking up all your time. No, don't, don't worry. That's why we're here to talk about things, answer questions, ask questions, figure it out. Yeah, so so in terms of what you can do, John, back to your original question is um, just just know that when I ask for money, I'm not looking for luxury and, and play money. I'm looking for this is really essential and needs to be replaced. And and if we're asked to cut, know that I'm going to cut the things that don't necessarily compromise the kids or the staff. It's going to compromise maybe some paved roads or, you know, you're not going to see the potholes fixed. It's It's going to try and keep the the urgency towards, you know, the population and, you know, I'll deprioritize planting trees and <laughs> things like that. So that makes sense. Sadly, it's uh, what you have to do, but it does yeah. make sense. Yeah. So anyway, so you can just say yes to all my requests. How's that for a good support? Not, 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 not good to me. <laughs> The easy answer, uh, you know, and, and if you know, what makes sense too. The way you say it is, you know, if we can, if we can get something done today, we're going to save money tomorrow. I mean, it's yep. why wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about it. And a and a new heat pump at the middle school, say it ranges depending on its size from six thousand to fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars for one heat pump, depending again on its size. They're much more efficient when they're brand new versus the 26 or eight year old heat pumps that we're replacing. They're dogs, they're right. sucking the juice and they're costing us money at the utility side. So it pays to replace them. Exactly. Awesome. Uh, so when, I know in the past we've met, you know, depending on what we have going on, sometimes it's every month, sometimes it's been every other month. Do you want to, um, while we're going through budget and all that, should we meet again end of end of February? Sure. Um, I'm going to be away the last, the very last week of February. I'm going out to visit my son, so I'll be out from the 26th of February to March for March 2nd or something like that. Okay. But other, uh, other. The week before that is the. Uh, that's vacation week, right? Yeah. Yes. That's why I've. That's why I avoided traveling that week. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so we could do like the. Uh, we could do like the fifteenth. That'd be in three weeks. Well, I'll have more. Yeah. I'll have more of an ask, but maybe I don't know when the first round of your budget considerations happens as a board. Uh, we could go into early March if you wanted, because then by then I'll have some things more solidified with Kate in terms of what's going to be on our list. So right, well, well, we'll push it out to the eighth of uh, the eighth of March. That's you said you were you're getting back. Uh, yep, I think I'll be back on the second. I got to pull up my calendar. That's a Thursday. Yeah, so we'll just do it the following uh, the following Wednesday. Does that work for you? Yep. Yep. It should work right. fine. 
Yep. The same time, we'll do that. Yep. Sounds great. All right. Perfect. Does so anybody have any, any final thoughts or questions? All right. If you have any questions, fire them my way. You can email me or whatever, and I'll I'll reply. Especially if things come to you as a question during your budget considerations. I'm always happy to answer. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good. All right. Thanks all. All right. Thanks, Todd. Yep. Bye, guys. Good night. Take care. Nice to meet you, Todd. You too, Carolyn. Bye. Bye-bye.